This is George Washington, the first president of the United States and arguably the greatest president of the United States. He was a man of vision, a godly man, a founding father, a man of great uh, strategic ability when it came to leading the armies to victory. And after the great revolutionary war, he came back and in 1783, he made 13 toasts, which became decrees, which came to fruition. And in one of those toasts, it was that America was going to be the light of the nations and that everyone around them, all the other hurting nations, he would open the door because it was it was biblical and because it was expected of a Christian nation to receive the the favor of the Most High God if they were to open their doors to the persecuted around them. And that's what they did. And so the America became the land of opportunity where immigrants would come in from all over the place and they would flood the lands. And they did flood the lands. And this singularly great action of George Washington caused the favor of the Lord to fall upon the nation, which in turn led to the second great awakening brought by the Puritan uh, doctrines and movement. And this is where my story today takes off. There was a man who was a uh, an immigrant from Ireland, a very young man at the time, came with his parents in the fleeing from from their home place and they came to America, the land of opportunity, and they ended up in New York and it was a place called the Burnt Over District. And another time I'll tell you why it was called the Burnt Over District, but not today. Today, this, this story is going to be about uh, James Coffey. Uh, one, some have dubbed him the king of all revival preachers, and he gets lost somewhere between Charles Finney and D.L. Moody. But uh, I promise you, this man was a godly, saintly man filled with the power like Stephen Holy Ghost power. And I want to tell you a little bit about him today, and you can go ahead and research it yourself the rest of the way. But I have many stories to tell you about this man. I want to tell you about how he influenced us today and how we have seen the Holy Spirit's work through him even in our in our services today. Stay tuned. Hi everyone, thank you for joining me again. Thank you for subscribing and liking. And if this is your first time, I just want to encourage you to listen to this old guy for a little bit because maybe there's something in this story about James Coffey that might encourage you. And uh, though I might not be as polished and put together as a lot of people on the internet, I'm uh, telling you some legitimate stories uh, to the best of my abilities based on what I've studied over the last you know, 30 years of my life. I love revival, as I said from the beginning. And if you're watching, it's probably because you love revival. And the more stories that you can can uh, uh, swallow, the better it is, because then you can yourself in your community be some sort of revivalist by the power of the Spirit. And, and these men teach us something that we're missing today. Men like James Coffey, they teach us that there was a power available through to from uh, you know from the early church on that uh, is is dramatically affected today by our wants, our lusts, our needs, and uh, ourselves. We're so focused on ourselves that that we don't care for the things of the gospel. And uh, you know, there's even a scripture verse verse that says, "No man careth for the things of God; they they only care for themselves." Uh, I, I think today is especially true. And uh, so what we need to do is is get back to our roots and rely wholly and fully on the Holy Ghost. Now, this man, James Coffey, was certainly this kind of uh, fellow. He, he was all about the power that was available through Jesus Christ and the reading of the word and prayer and petition. Uh, he was a, an Irish-born fellow. Uh, again, he was born in 1810. He was saved in what was called the burnt out district. Now, I told you uh, in the in the 
in the uh, prelude video that I wasn't going to talk about uh, the burnt out district too much. So I'll just give you a Cole's notes. In the day of J James Coffey's salvation, uh, there were what they called circuit riders. And this was largely uh, because of the influence of John Wesley, uh, you know, a hundred years before uh, Whitfield. Uh, they, they would ride on their horses and and there was an area uh, in in uh, uh, New York State called the Burnt Over District, and uh, James Coffey was living there. There, they just crossed over, and there was so much preaching. They literally uh, burned it out with the gospel. At least they thought until guys like Charles Finney and uh, the like would go through there, which uh, James Coffey was also a circuit rider, but. Um, well, before I spoil anything for you, I, I just want to give you a bit of a background. James Coffey, um, and you'll see here in a picture, he had a pretty serious gaze. He was a tall man uh, with uh, pronounced features. Uh, he could tell stories like George Whitfield from the pulpit that were unmatched. And uh, he had a certain um, ability, and this was a gift in the Holy Ghost uh, to to uh, draw these elaborate pictures uh, with his words that would enthrall the audience as though they were in the story itself. And this kind of preaching swept many people into the, the kingdom of God. But that was only the beginning of his ministry. In 1839, something happened to him. The Holy Spirit met him as he was studying to show himself approved unto God, as he was praying before the Lord and seeking the scriptures because he wanted more of what the Father had to offer him, more of the Spirit of God. And so he was beseeching the Lord and studying about this, uh, about the second work of grace that John Wesley would often preach about. And he himself, James Coffey, was preaching about as well. Uh, this, this, the power and the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and uh, and some are offended at even mentioning the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But these are the the these are the accounts that I'm telling you about, not to offend anybody. But these are the accounts of these men who claim to have had these amazing experiences uh, of the filling of the Holy Spirit in, in for the sake of ministry in a way that they they didn't even imagine was possible. People like D.L. Moody and Wesley and, and George Whitfield, and I can go on and on. All of these men had had the encounter I'm about to tell you about in 1839 uh, it w involving James Coffey. He said that it was toward twilight one evening in, I think it was July in, um, in, in 1839. Uh, he was a, remember, he was a Methodist elder, a, a Methodist minister. And uh, he was, he was a, a, a glorious preacher already. Uh, much of it was even in his, in his own inherited gifts. So he was operating in the gifts of the Spirit that God had put upon him. But he was not yet baptized in the Holy Ghost in the way that that uh, some preach. And so he was wondering, what is it that's available to me? And he felt that he was only touching the surface. And then again, he, he uh, was beseeching God in prayer. And sure enough, the Spirit of God, and God met him. If you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. And James Coffey in this moment had never been nearer to God. And God gave him a vision. He said that he was pervaded by the light from heaven. And in the very light, God spoke to him. And he told him, I'm going to send you to uh, Europe and England and Canada, and you shall do my work and I will let no harm come to you. You will come back safely. And I'm sure uh, James Coffey had his own insecurities, but God assured him he was going to bring him back. And then God began to flood his soul with the power of the Holy Spirit until, like D.L. Moody, he was almost yelling out, stay your hand, O Lord. And isn't it nice to know that that's there for us who desire to live holy for for us, for you, for anybody, and God makes it available for them who will seek his face because, after all, he's a rewarder of those who seek him. 
and uh, James Coffey was looking for for more power in the Holy Ghost for the sake of winning souls for the gospel and um, so that he also will stand before God, a worker approved, and God met him and uh, he it changed his life. And like Jesus, after he came down from the mountain and uh, there were multitudes gathered, his fame grew, uh, so it was with James Coffey from this moment. It was his mountaintop meeting. And then he became a completely different minister uh, and, and people couldn't stand under his gaze, under his preaching, under his storytelling. And uh, um, I'll give you some examples in a bit. But one of his most famous converts um, was uh, William Booth and his wife. And um, his wife once said, "There is uh, he is unmatched in 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 uh, among preachers." Uh, and James uh, William Booth, uh, of course, of the Salvation Army, attributes his very soul uh, to Christ Jesus, but to the work of Christ through James Coffey. He had never heard preaching before or since, and he himself was a revival preacher. Um, but he certainly had the best of examples by James Coffey. Now, one of the ways James Coffey uh, would would present the gospel is he would draw these amazing pictures like Wet Whitfield, um, and people would come to what they called the penitent area, which effectively he employed the uh, the the uh, altar call. And so you see in these big, uh, you know, these big um, Billy Graham crusades and stuff, the altar call, Billy Graham calls them to the front. That that actually effectively was the work of the Holy Spirit through James Coffey. And uh, he would call people to the front and 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 hundreds sometimes thousands would come and then he would we would walk around the crowd praying and pleading with them that they needed if they were on the fence that they needed Christ Jesus and they sh they should make the decision because uh, after all if you're convinced that Christ is a truth should you wait it may equal eternity damned without him and so he pleaded with people don't wait if you're convinced that he is the Christ and he is the Lord, which he is, and uh, that then you need to make that decision today. And so he effectively employed or deployed by the Lord's work and hand uh, the altar call. Now, this was a cause for concern among the higher ups in the Methodist movement, uh, especially since it had broken off in branches, which, by the way, grieved James Coffey because he felt like it was a uh, it was terrible that we should not be in unity in one body. So he he saw division as a demonic and um, and he certainly wasn't happy that the higher ups and the the leadership over him. Uh, came against him when it came to employing the uh, altar call because of respectability. The higher-ups felt that James Coffey didn't care much for respectability, and he didn't. And his response was, you know, it's respectability that is the enemy of revival. When a man isn't able to humble himself anymore as a child or fall face down before the Lord, should it be required repenting of his life and iniquity and uh, and giving his life to Christ, uh, it, it, it can't be uh, it, it can't be about respectability. And so uh, because, you know, when God is for you, who can be against you? James Coffey continued on with great success, even to the end of his days. But uh, he also made resolves. And when he made a resolve, it was like a vow to God. And he made these four resolves. Number one, the absolute necessity of the immediate influence of the Holy Ghost to impart power, efficiency, and success to a preached gospel. His second resolve was the absolute necessity of praying more frequently, more fervently, more perseveringly, and more believingly for the aid of the Holy Spirit in his ministry. 
Now, this has really spoken to me this week, this believing in prayer. It's not that I don't believe in prayer. I certainly do. I, I, I spend time in prayer every day. And when I go there, I often have to, you know, climb that hill uh, to believe instead of just immediately believing first. And so James Coffey was committed to believing first. And, uh, and, and so that's really taken a hold of me. I hope something has taken a hold of you. Now, this third uh, point, or rather uh, resolve, is more of an internal decree to God. Like I said, it was a vow from his heart to God. Um, and it's, it's this. This is the third um, resolve. That my labors will be powerless and comfortless and valueless without the aid of the Holy Spirit. I'm a cloud without water, a tree without fruit, dead and rootless, a sound uncertain, unctionless and meaningless. Such will be the character of my ministry without the aid of the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of God alone which imparts significant, significance and power to the word preached, without which, as one has expressed it, all the threatenings of the Bible will be no more than thunder to the deaf or lightning to the blind. A seal requires weight, a hand upon it, in order to make, it in, and to make an impression. The soul of the penitent sinners is the wax. Gospel truth is the seal. But without the almighty hand of God and of the Holy Ghost, that seal remains powerless. Now unto his final resolve. Resolve number four goes something like this. No man has ever been significantly useful in winning souls for Christ without the help of the Holy Spirit. With it, the most humblest talents may astonish earth and hell by gathering into the path of life thousands for the skies, while without the Spirit, the finest and most splendid talent remain comparatively useless. Now these words of James Coffey, these resolves, they've really spoken to me. I hope they've challenged you to make some resolves for yourself between you and God. I certainly have had some challenges during even this, the, uh, the reading of these resolves, how committed he was to the end of his life. I, I hope the Lord will put that faithfulness in me and keep it as well. Um, you know, uh, I, I haven't really talked about the power of Jesus Christ. When, when I talk about the power that was available to him of the Holy Ghost in his meetings, uh, well, here is one example. Here is a, a testimony of the type of power. He was in London one time, and, uh, and the, there was a sense of awe that came over everybody, not just a sense of awe as in some emotional thing. The presence of the Lord came upon the entire crowd of thousands of people. And here's what happened. At this moment, an influence, evidently from heaven, came upon the people suddenly. It seemed like some mighty bursting of a storm of wind upon an extensive forest. The entire congregation was in motion, some preparing even to flee the place, while others were in the act of prostrating themselves before the Lord God of hosts. Cries for mercy and piercing supplications for purity of heart were heard from all parts of the agitating mass in galleries, as well as throughout the body of the chapel, while purified souls were exalting in the loftiest strains of adoration and praise. The scene was beyond description, grand and sublimely awful. Now, what a great event. I mean, what, what, amazing, what an amazing thing to witness uh, in England. But it wasn't only in England, in fact, for you Canadians, for us Canadians, it should be encouraging to know that when this man came to Canada, the same thing, in fact, something greater happened in uh, Toronto. Uh, the man was preaching, James Coffey was preaching to the, to the masses, to the crowds, and suddenly the presence of the Holy Ghost, the presence of God fell upon the people as a mist almost, and James Coffey uh, hid under his uh, uh, pulpit because the power uh, was so fearful upon uh, the people, not in disobedience, but to bring them to the reality that God is someone to be feared, that we need to walk with fear and trembling. And like Felix, when his knees shook, 
every single person in the auditorium's uh, knees were shaking and they were in fear that they were enemies of God. And so anyone who was under the conviction uh, of the Holy Spirit and, and was experiencing this tremendous trembling fear, they literally fled. Th there was many, many people that tried to flee that place. And um, uh, they were convicted within 100 or 200 feet from the place they had fallen on their face, basically perfectly arrested uh, to their design, to God's design for them. They had surrendered to God's design and, um, and gave their lives to Christ. And I'm sure there are great grandparents that we have that were, you know, as Canadians, maybe we have uh, uh, great grandparents or relatives that were affected deeply by this man's ministry and to this day the lineage carries forward anyway that's my final story about james coffee i hope there is something in this you can usurp that challenges you that encourages you thanks for spending this time with me until next time we'll see you later god bless you and by the way if you have any prayer requests please Put them in the comment section. I'll try to get to them. Uh, I, I can't promise if there's, you know, hundreds of people. I, I, I don't even have hundreds of people who listen to this. But eventually, um, prayerfully, that'll happen. And if it does, it's very difficult to keep up. But for right now, uh, send your prayer requests. As personal as they are, I will pray for them and for you. Thank you so much. See you later. Bye.